Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I am your host, Sherrard. Hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful Wednesday evening. I know I am, and I'm so excited about tonight's episode of the show. We have two uh, gentlemen and a scholar on the show that are going to be talking about their career, as well as their businesses and how they are able to stay relevant in their businesses this evening. On our special segment entitled, My Name is My Brand, and it's Sponsored by iHeartRadio, ladies and gentlemen. iHeartRadio is one of the sponsors for the Sherrard Show. So if you missed the episode on Essence Television, you can always listen to it on iHeartRadio. We've had some of the greatest and biggest interviews, such as Smokey Robinson. We've had uh, Stevie Wonder, the Manhattans, the Isley Brothers, and many, many more. So definitely check it out on iHeartRadio. It's right there on your monitor. And it's also brought to you by Essence Television. Essence Television is the home of the Sherrard Show, where again, you can watch it right on your television, the greatest episodes of your life. And you can be able to even interact and watch the live feeds on it. So follow your monitor, spell it right, and you can watch it on your Roku, as well as on your Amazon Fire device. And then lastly, it's brought to you by my foundation, which is called Sharp Minded Cultural Center. This is the foundation that allows me to be able to teach individuals with autoimmune illnesses like myself to be able to play the piano, runway, uh, act, and even sing when an opportunity was not afforded to them. You can always donate. You can uh, follow the link that's right there on your monitor to be able to be a part or even be a mentor at Sharp Minded Cultural Center. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's, it, it's very important to be smart um, as a businessman, but it's even more important to keep a good name. Many people have soiled their reputation, even having a great name or having great, doing great business, but having a poor reputation. And we're going to talk about two individuals. One man has been doing it for 42 years, and apparently he's been doing it the right way because he is still pushing hard and even snapping in uh, New York Fashion Week and working with some of the biggest names, not only in the shores of uh, America, but also on the other side of the pond in Europe. And he's here to tell his story. He's a Chicago boy as well. And that's Rudy. That's uh, Rudy Arias. Let's see if I pronounce his name right. Arias. Is that correct, Rudy? Arias. Arias. There we go. <laughs> and then we have a gentleman that not only speaks English, but he speaks French. And he's from the shores of Haiti. He's an oh, entrepreneur, a real businessman, a devoted husband. And one thing he does, two things that's so impressive, is that he helps uh, young individuals with their education. And he sees the power of scholarships and helping you know, those who may not have been able to afford going to a college or a university, but he helps them with that, as well as helping your business. But also, he is a publisher. If you look at your monitor, he is the publisher of this book uh, written by Toby Rubenstein. She was recently on the show entitled Faith in Fashion. This book is an excellent, excellent book that gives you a multitude of essays and a very touching story. You definitely want to purchase it. We're actually doing a, rif a raffle for it as well. And he's on the Sherrard Show for the first time. Mr. Gene Alert. Welcome, sir. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I I'm I, I'm around greatness. Rudy, thank you, you know, for being here too. You know, so I'm excited to be part of this. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. learn a lot from you, Rudy. That is years. correct. That is correct. Now, Rudy <laughs> um, is a very funny guy. He has you cracking up, but we're going to start off he with does. you. Now, help me get through this interview, Rudy. I don't want to be laughing so much. I can't even ask you the questions I want to. But Rudy, tell us a little bit about your secret of being able to maintain being a, a celebrity photographer for 42 years, sir? I think a lot of it has to do is that I don't really, how can I word this? It's the humility. I, I keep it real. I mean, I've been around some very well-known people and I've actually witnessed what it's done to them. And I didn't want to go there. I mean, I witnessed that they, the celebrity and the, the public view creates a little bubble that they keep themselves in and they're so isolated that they lose touch with everything. I've seen it and I didn't want to go there to the, to the purpose that, you know, it, it's like uh, uh, when I'm with an artist here at the, Fort, uh, the Florida theater or any place else, you know, if I do any backstage shots or whatever, I keep it very discreet and so forth. And I know the boundaries. 
Whereas you have Pazzarazzi, it's like boom, 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 boom. And I keep very quiet and I stay in the background. But now, but now Rudy, um, and, and I'll get you in this in, in a minute, Gene. Now, Rudy, um, it's very easy to um, say, you know what, I don't want to be put in that box. But a lot of times forces push you in that box because of the caliper of your work. How were you able to avoid this these 42 years? Uh, in the beginning, it was really ignorance. Uh, growing up in Chicago, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And ironically, uh, the only thing that actually drove me towards photography when I was young was I would shoot a local rock band. I would shoot local models and I would charge at that time, you know, we're talking about mid late seventies. I charged like, you know, 30, 40, 50 bucks. But by the time I was through with everything, I always seem to have either 10 or $15 in my pocket. And to me, I'm like, okay, I'm on to something. Little did I realize that the more money I made, the less money I would have in my pocket. Okay. I couldn't help. That's my, that's me. And I never really considered myself good. I mean, through a bunch of circumstances and so forth, I slowly grew. And like I was telling you earlier about, I had an admiration for Joseph Karsh. I really worked on emulating his style, his technique and so forth. And it came to the point where I realized that everybody else was trying to do that. And I came from Chicago and at that time, you know, let, let's get real here. The, the stigma that Chicago had as far as photography was concerned, aside that it was like the catalog capital of the world with Spiegel's and everybody else under the sun, the stigma of it is was the headquarters of Playboy. And everybody around me was striving to be like a Playboy photographer. And that didn't really appeal to me. But you, you, know, you can make a lot of money being a Playboy photographer, but that's not the direction you want to go. Is that right? No, because yeah, the, the thing, yeah, you can make a lot of money, but to me, uh, in the beginning, you know, I kind of like, okay, you know, let's, let's see if this works or this works, but I got bored with it. And I was still through the stages of not really wanting, not really knowing. That's what it came down to, because I was torn between sneaking, you know, sneaking into bars, shooting the local bands, doing their promo to shooting local uh, models who needed work to build their books, to get into the agencies mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Now, let me kick it over to you, uh, uh, Gene. Now, you being a young man and being um, in the industry of publishing and being an entrepreneur, um, starting your business out, first of all, what kind of struggles did you um, have to go through starting your own publishing company um, and being able to get authors to want to self-publish with you? Well, before I get into that, right, I'll answer that question. But I, I'm listening to you, Rudy, and I'm saying, wow, because you said uh, you, you basically followed your passion, right? And I believe with ACA, my, my business is because you said I'm an entrepreneur. I am an entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur. So I've been in business for 21 years. And... Um, and I know I look young. Everyone thinks I just started my business five years ago, three years ago, but I started when I was 18. And uh, in the beginning, it was more of, because I come from a Haitian background. So in our culture, it's, there's only three jobs, three careers. You're either a lawyer, a doctor, engineer. So if you weren't any of those things, you're a failure, right? So now I had to come tell my family, hey, I want to get into real estate. You know, and that's actually how I started making uh, my money and building my business. But then when I started ACA in 2007, um, I was dabbling in different parts of entertainment. And me and Rudy were talking offline. So I worked in the comedy space. I worked, I was managing NFL players. I was doing marketing, working with brands, fashion week. 
I was uh, I was working with models. I was working with uh, managing uh, actors, uh, screenwriters, directors, trying to sell scripts. None of those things interest me, right? Just like Rudy said, as far as the, you know, yeah, I could shoot for Playboy, but it didn't really interest me, right? What I found, and to get to your question, what I found was I wanted to help individuals. When we first got on this call, Rudy said, um, the brand is, is, is not about me. It's about the clients. It's about the customers because without the customers, we wouldn't be here. And I totally agree because Gene Alert wouldn't be Gene Alert. No one would sign Toby, Rubenstein. Nobody would work with Gene Alert if someone didn't. I wouldn't be on the show if Toby didn't give me the, the thumbs up, right? It, talking to you. I would have never met you guys. You know, so of course your word and your, the, your reputation, people call it brand now, <laughs> but Rudy knows, you know, it's all about reputation. It's all, that's really what builds your business, right? So the reason why people sign and work with Citadel Publishing or ACA Branding is because of Gene, right? When I first started in real estate, I was an 18 year old, uh, Haitian, Haitian kid, you know, uh, uh, in Long Island and Long Island was not, you know, I was a minority. Right. And I had people telling me, you know, Hey, because you're, because you're black and I'm talking about my family because you're black, you're not going to be able to do well in real estate in Long Island because you're young. You're not going to be able to do well in real estate. You're not going to be able to do good in the industry because you, uh, you don't know how to dress which is not the truth, right? <laughs> so, and uh, so because you know how to dress, they gave me all these obstacles, all these things that for most people would have been like, oh, you know what, you're right. But I was so determined. I believe, I believe because my parents instilled, instilled in me that in America, there's a lot of opportunity and it's all about this. You have to learn how to process problems and you have to, if you're determined and you persistent, you'll win, right? So I wanted to help business owners overcome. And because of that energy, because of that passion, right? I had it in real estate. I went into uh, purchasing property. From there, once I realized I started opening a business, it, we're, in, we're actually in my um, home theater, right? It's called Brooklyn Swirl Home Theater because Brooklyn Swirl was the frozen yogurt business that they told me wouldn't work. They said Bedford-Stuyvesant, where it, it actually opened, they said that the people in Bedford Stuyvesant wouldn't want frozen yogurt because the competition is the bodega, right? And it so turned I out said, to not be true. And huh? it turned out not to be true. And so our first day, we had about 2,000 people show up. And so, and from, from there, you know, the sky was the limit. But that's well, a whole you know, other story. But you know, but, um, you know when, when they were building the Sears Tower in Chicago, uh, Rudy, I'm sure there was plenty of people saying that bill, why are you going to build a building that to tower? We got plenty of building because at, at the time they were building the Sears Tower, which is called the Willis Tower now, the Prudential yep. building was the tallest building <laughs> in all yep. of the city. But now somebody told them that and now you see, voila, what sense does that make? What little sense does that make to be a naysayer? And we're going to talk more about you, Gene, because he has an extensive re resume, ladies and gentlemen. He helps individuals um, get scholarships. Um, he also, um, not only that, but he's published books and he's a book publisher. So that means that if you want to publish your version of Mary Had a Little Lamb, just talk to this man right here. He'll be able to assist you in that. Now, Rudy, I'm going to kick it back to you for a minute. Now, you said something um, that is very interesting, and I like how you said it, but let me, let, let's dig into this a little deeper. You were mentioning about how clients, and uh, Gene was just piggybacking off what you're saying. I said, your name is your brand, and the reason why um, I titled that is because there's many people who have great um, skills. They have very good skills, but they don't know how to deal with the customer. And many businesses have gone out of business because they had a great product, but they were very rude to the customers. And unless it's your essentials, 
normally you you won't go somewhere you only buy where where you like for example if you want to get a range rover and you live in new york city um bob's range rovers is not the only place that you can get a range rover you can get it anywhere in new york city so rudy tell me this why do you say it's about the clients first opposed to about your name it, because without them i wouldn't exist and I'm a little different situation than most photographers. You have a lot of photographers that basically are jack of all trades, all right? I'm in a niche and I've stayed in that niche. You have photographers that work during the day and they're photographers on weekends and in the evenings. You have uh, photographers that basically shoot weddings, shoot uh, uh, portraits, and then they do the models on the side thinking that they could get somewhere and so forth. You have photographers that all they live for is to get published in online magazines, not realizing that that's fine and dandy, but I get paid for my content. I get paid to shoot campaigns and so forth. And what I learned being in Europe is that it's really about relationships. And that's what I build with the creatives and the designers that I work for. It's about relationships because it's not about appeasing the general public. It's not about me having a ton of clients. It's about translating their vision into a visual media that will draw who they're aiming for. In my case, women, they will actually draw women into the photograph wanting to be that girl, wanting to wear the clothes, wanting to be in that photo shoot that compels them to buy the clothes. That's now, why I don't shoot, you know, the, you, you got a lot of photographers, you got a lot of people that are really under the conception that the voguing, uh, what I call the uh, glossy photography and fashion is where it's at. That's true when it comes to commercial fashion. True fashion is the art of imperfection. Commercial fashion is the art of perfection where everything's so homogenized that it puts it drives the image into obscurity. True fashion is the art of imperfection that catches the eye and draws the person into the photo where it becomes memorable. Give us an example of what you mean by that, because you know you're speaking of something that that originally was very popular in the '70s and '80s in terms of what you're speaking about. But now when you talk about fashion in the 2000s and the 2010s and 20s, now you feel like you have to be flawless because you have to get plastic surgery and all no. this to be perfect. No. But no. tell me, um, uh, tell me about Rudy, why, um, give me an example of, an, of the uh, art of imperfection that draws you into the photo. Okay, uh, classic example, uh, it really began in the 70s as far as the art of perfection. It began with the designers, it actually began on the American side of the pond, on our side, okay? And it exploded after 73. November 73 was pinnacle in the history of American fashion. November uh, in 1973, Elizabeth Lambert arranged for a fundraiser at Versailles, which actually turned out to be a battle between French designers and American designers. And the American designers mopped the floor with them. It, it, it brought the importance of African-American models to Europe. It brought the import, you know, a designer like Stephen Burrell, uh, I mispronounced his name, but he, designed colorful clothes that had life. You had Halstead that made clothes that were not only wearable, but they had fluid, fluid. And it also introduced the American way of doing runway shows, which is now the standard. The French would do uh, runway shows where they would have the girls walking through the aisles wearing a number. We brought production to the runway. Wow, that's amazing. And, that, mm. and, and that's what led to this. Because you have to understand, in the 1920s and 30s with Hollywood, you had this 
whole stigma of the glamour photographer shooting the starlets. And they had studios. Whereas in Europe, studios are rare because of the expenses and so forth. So the magazines would just tell the photographers to go shoot it in the street. Ironically, that, that style of imperfection overtook this tone of imperfection in the late 70s with a person by the name of Peter Lindbergh. He actually brought it to it. And as far as street photography, you have William Klein. These are people that I not only admire, but I have deep respect for. And then on the other end, and Richard Avedon, who was into movement. Wow. Prior to, prior to that, you had that Hollywood glamour mentality of, okay, pose them this way, pose them this way. And that's why a lot of photographers feel that shooting fashion is nothing more than portrait photography. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, it is a shooting catalog. And as far as example of memorable pictures, pick up a catalog. Pick up the, you know, when our day, Montgomery Awards, J.C. Penney, Sears, Spiegel, the whole thing. Yeah, they're clothes and so forth, but you have no clue who those models are. You have no clue who shot it. I agree. And that's what I'm speaking about when I was thinking about it. It was prominent in the 70s and 80s. And those models that they used, and, and I'm getting going to kick this to Eugene as well. Those models they used in those Montgomery Ward um, and those Spiegel catalogs and all that and Wee Boats were the same models they used for many, many years. They, they didn't change them out. They just use the same ones in different poses and different outfits. Now, um, we'll come back to you in a moment, um, Rudy. Now, let me ask you a question, Gene. This is um, in regards to something you said earlier, um, especially about starting your real estate company in Long Island, um, being so young. Now, you look like you're about 24 years old, kind of look like Reggie Bush a little <laughs> bit there. Um, now, how were you able to deal with, and I'm sure um, maybe a topic for another day, but you got you had dealt with a lot of racism and a lot of disrespect. I know being a young guy trying to get out there like that. How were you able to deal with it? Hmm. Um, I guess I was in a bubble, man, because uh, I mean, I didn't really uh, feel racism in uh, when I was in, growing up. You know, I grew up in Long Island, so uh, I didn't really feel it as you know it wasn't like in your face like it is today you know in some parts of the country but uh i had great mentors most of my mentors were italian and jewish um they taught me they brought me to the uh golf course uh i uh they introduced me to the network of people to help me elevate um i had uh, an italian man help me purchase my first home you know so I, it wasn't as, you know, what we see in the media about, you know, they're trying to divide the country and divide people. Um, a lot of the people that helped me, you know, I had people on both sides. You know, you have, there's always going to be some, you know, but they're just not going to talk to you. <laughs> you know, they're just not going to help you. They just, they, they might not say anything to you. Oh, don't come in my house or, but uh, in real estate, I would go to Great Neck. I would do deals in Great Neck, places where people told me not to go, you know? <laughs> and uh, because I went to school at Hofstra University, uh, those kids were bringing me home to their parents and they saw me as, they didn't look at me as, oh, look at this black kid. They said, oh, this is my son's friend. This is my daughter's friend, you know? And he does real estate. He's in real estate and I need help. And what I learned, but what helped me is I looked in the mirror and I said, okay, People are telling me that um, uh, the objections, right? That they were trying to put in my, the negative thinking that they were trying to put in my head was, okay, I'm young, I'm, I'm black, uh, I don't dress well. I dress like a kid, I was 18, uh, a college student, and I wasn't educated on real estate. So what I did was I can't change the fact that I'm black. I can't change the fact that I'm young. I can't change this baby face, I'm, 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 I smile, you know? Uh, it's how I keep this. People ask me my secret, how I look. I'm about to turn 40 this year. And they ask me, how you stay so young? How you look? And I said, I smile. I'm happy. I, I'm, I'm grateful. But anyway, so I know I could change my clothes. I could deal. I could, uh, I, I could learn how to dress and I could educate myself on the subject that I'm in the, in the business, in the area of focus, right? Just like Rudy 
uh, educate himself on um, on on in the area, the niche that he wanted. My niche at the time was real estate, and I focused on one area, and I and I mastered it, right? Um, and so when I spoke in with people, they didn't look at me as a college student. They didn't look. They looked at me as a person. They saw me as a person that knew that could help them solve the problem once again, right? And once I helped the person, the client solve the problem, they forgot. They they it, they forgot about race. They forgot about uh, how young I was. They forgot because I got the problem solved. And that's when what Rudy said again: put the customer first, right? And that's all I did. I didn't put everybody else's uh, misconceptions of of trying to separate. I didn't do that, right? I know I come from an island full of black presidents, lawyers, doctors, engineers, uh, architects. So someone telling me I can't, I can't be the first president is not true because I come from an island full of presidents, you know, black people. Like, you know, you can't tell me I can't be a doctor. I have a family full of doctors. You can't tell me I, I can't be an OBGYN because I have a family full of them. Architects, engineers, uh, lawyers. So you can't tell me I can't do something because I, I've seen it. Right. And the only time you could hold someone down and tell them that they can't, and that is, is, it's the exposure. Right. And that's why I'm so happy that I, I was exposed to different great mentors, people that exposed me to, because you hear de deals happen on the golf course. But if no one takes you to the golf course, how are you ever going to know that? <laughs> well, well, Gene. Right. And, and, that's, that's and so. That's absolutely correct. But, um, you know, I'll interrupt something real, Gene. Um, Gene, you were saying, you know, nobody can tell you what you can't become. And that's true. But as a New Yorker, you cannot become a Cubs fan. So forget it. That you can't, you can't become what? You're not gonna, you can't become a Chicago Cubs fan. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> the, the Chicago Cubs, the uh, baseball team. See there? Okay, gentlemen, I'm back. I don't know the connection kind of got low, but I, please forgive me on that. Rudy, I, That's I want because you more. need fiber. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to need to do that, definitely. Rudy, um, so, right, yes, sir. No, I was saying, uh, you were about to say something about New York, and we shut it down. Oh, no, no. <laughs> oh, one. I guess one of the New Yorkers are controlling the um, internet. Yeah. They're trying to shut it down. But no, I love New York. What I was saying was that you know, as a New Yorker, you know, a New Yorker cannot be a Cubs fan. You're either, you're total Yankee. Oh, <laughs> okay, 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 okay. That's what okay. I was speaking about. And to inject, <laughs> uh, the Cubs have clearly proven that there isn't Hashim because they <laughs> understand it. <laughs> amen, amen, uh, amen. Now, um, and, and we part we and, and part me for the technical difficulties. We are back talking to two gentlemen. Um, one is a celebrity photographer, has been doing it for 42 years. Uh, and he's Rudy, he's um actually homegrown from Chicago, and he's currently um in an Atlantic uh time zone in uh Florida, but he also resides in New York City. And then we have one that's for all the way from Haiti, ladies and gentlemen. But he's been born and raised in Brooklyn. He's young, only it's about to be 39 years old, about to be 40, but he still looks like he's about 24 years old, speaking his wisdom. Now, um, I was I was born in Haiti. You were born in Haiti, but you grew yeah. up in Brooklyn. Is that correct? Grew up in Brooklyn. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Very good. <laughs> and and he's imparting his wisdom. And if you if he holds up that watch and that wedding band, it's enough to feed all the hungry in America. If you look at <laughs> uh, that watch and that um, band alone, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what uh, watch? Uh, uh, the left hand, please, sir. Let's get that. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So let's stop it now. Um, now, let me kick it to you, Rudy, and then I'm going to throw it to you, and then we're going to take a few questions from our audience members as well. Now, Rudy, um, what is it about you? Now, you were mentioning something off air, and we kind of want to touch on that. You were saying things have to be kind of laid out for you in order for you to shoot. In other words, 
things have to be set in order before you shoot. So this is a two part question. So my question is what will a model who's watching tonight get from you when they reach out to you and say, I want you to do my comp card for me? Okay, for starters, <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't shoot typically like other photographers. Uh, aside from Peter Lindbergh, I also practice social distancing before it became chic. Because I shoot with long prime lenses because the image, uh, the image compression is much better. You've heard the stigma that you gain 14 pounds on print. That's because photographers use short lenses. I use the long lenses to minimize the weight gain. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I like to give the face room to breathe. Because with me, it's not about posing. It's about capturing the essence of the moment that they'll give. I'll give them something to think about and so forth. I'll talk to them. And basically setting it like a movie director, as one model told me. She says, I'm a director because she, she acts. And I let them cultivate it. But the key is that it has to come across spontaneous and not posed. Do you follow? Uh, most digital Polaroids and stuff like that that the agencies want, it's all in the studio and it's pretty basic. It's here and there and so forth. Uh, with me, it's about capturing the essence. So when a woman looks at it, she's drawn into it. And I also shoot from a feminine perspective, not a male perspective. It's like looking at Vogue and looking at Maxim magazine. The girls are wearing clothes, but Maxim is shot from a male perspective. Vogue isn't. Interesting. So um, okay. if a model is there reaching, wanting to reach out and say, you know, I need, I want this guy to be my next photographer. I saw him on a Shivard show. How would the setup go? Well, they reach me out. They reach out to me and so forth. First words out of my mouth is, is that basically if they're not with an agency, I want, I would want to meet them in a public place like a Panera Bread. That's usually my MO here in Jacksonville. And I'll meet with them in, at Panera Bread. And I'll talk to them and if, and, and if, you know, I see potential or if the reasoning's right, then we schedule a test. And I tell them the more the merrier, bring a ton of people around and so forth. And uh, being in a, in a town like Jacksonville where everybody under the sun's a photographer, I found it quite interesting. So I, I kind of like I'm the one man out and it doesn't really bother me because I don't earn a living in this town, so to speak. And as far as plan and so forth, the, the reality of it is, is that when I, before I shoot a campaign, a lookbook or whatever, I ask the designer for sketches because I actually feed off the energy that they put into the sketches to translate their vision. I don't even look at the clothes. I don't see the clothes till the day of the shoot. Because for wow. me, it's to, for me, it's totally irrelevant. To me, it's to translate it, to draw it in. And if you've been through my Instagram, you notice there's this consistency, but the photos are you're drawn into them. Yeah, you know, yeah, you, you absolutely are. And um, I don't know, but you, it's, it's interesting. Um, being in the industry of fashion modeling and stuff, you know, a lot of times um, photographers are just doing it to be to get paid. So you, you, they don't really invest the time in getting the shot that really depicts the model. What they'll do is get some shots, but there's a shot that really, like for example, I'll give an example. If you look at Gene, uh, how he's dressed, he's dressed to his style. He's a man that looks good in a suit. The suit fits him. But there are some um, models, you, for example, like a, a male model, he's built like a football player, but he's wearing a suit. That doesn't necessarily, that's not a good look because that doesn't complement who he is. He's in a suit, may look nice, but that's not his style. So it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you're the kind of photographer that helps the models to find their look that really makes them even more marketable. Well, let me put it to you this way. Uh, would an agency or a mom who has a 14, 15 year old girl 
that wants to be a model and they go through the gambit of stuff, you know, the tests and everything else. The reality of it is that young woman, that young man is not going to find their true identity as a model till they hit about 16, 17 after so many test shoots, building their books and everything else. Okay. And that's a, that's a key thing. You have a lot of people there that basically will send their kids to this, to this, to this, to this, pay a ton of money. And to be honest with you, those places are nothing more than my, uh, finishing schools. Yeah, they teach the makeup, they teach this, they teach that. But they really don't dive into, if you really want to be somebody in this business, you have to find your identity and be able to project it. And the key is being yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So true. So true. Gene, um, and, and we're kind of running short on time. I want to get to you, Gene, and put you in this. Okay. Now, for example, Gene, um, for you, um, when someone comes to you and they want, a parent comes to you and they want to um, send their kid to broadcasting school and they want to uh, be part of the scholarship program you have, what's the qualifications and what's the limitations? So, okay. So there's two, there's two parts of my, it's called Faith, Grind, Inspire. And uh, so the scholarship is a character-based scholarship. So it's not a particular, you know, it's all about character, how the person is, right? Um, now, my program that I have in the school system, in the uh, New York City school system, it's called Faith Grind Inspire Entrepreneur Program. So I teach kids entrepreneurship inside the schools to try to teach them um, either in three areas, housing, jobs, um, and agriculture. So they have to create a business that's going to help that's affecting their community. One of those three things. And even during, going, during COVID, we realized that all three of those areas were affected, you know? And so, um, so I'm trying to teach kids how to solve problems, how to process problems, because that's going to help them over the long term, right? Because in school, mo a lot of the times, they don't really teach you how to solve problems. They just tell you, hey, this is what you have to do. You, you just follow, right? And uh, I call it the sheep mentality. And uh, most entrepreneurs, majority of entrepreneurs are, don't think like sheep, right? And I love what Rudy said, because I thought about that as soon as he said it. He said, most people in the town uh, were going after uh, Playboy models, right? And most of the photographers are going this way. And all I saw was sheep, right? And Rudy went the other way by himself. And that's exactly what I do. That's why I try to teach the kids. Um, the scholarship is pretty much, uh, right now it's not, uh, a, the scholarship actually is not available. Um, right uh, to this day, we raised about $45,000 in scholarships that we gave out to kids. Um, it has, it, it's not a particular school. It's not a particular uh, uh uh, career path. It's really someone that has passion. I love kids that have passion. And if they have passion, they don't let their circumstances, their mom, their parents' story, their neighborhood uh, uh, hold them back, right? And to achieve their greatness and they want to give back, those are the kids that I, I honor and I um, give money to. Um, now, Gene, now, where would you be able to um, reach out to you G for Gene Alert? GeneAlert.com. J E A N A L E R T E dot com. Okay. Um, and what about yeah. for if they want to um, inquire about getting a book published? Again, Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> so, book publishing is uh, Citadel, uh, C I T A D L L E books dot com. Or you could just go to genealert dot com and click on Citadel Books. Um, now, the reason why I named it Citadel, Rudy and Sherrod, is this. So like I said, I'm Haitian. And when we got our independence, um, the first thing that Haitians did is that they uh, took over the Citadel and they said, this is gonna protect our land from anybody trying to take over Haiti again, right? Beautiful. No one's gonna do that. Beautiful. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to help self-published authors protect their work, right? Because there's a lot of great authors out there and they think that they have to go to a big publishing house I'm not going to name the names, but they, they think they have to go there. But once they go there, they sell their book, they sell the rights, and they don't even own, they can't even give a free book away because they don't own it, right? 
And so I help people and such as, as our mutual friend here, uh, Toby Rubenstein, she wanted, her story was so amazing. It's so empowering, so impactful, right? I helped her. I didn't help her write anything, right? I just helped publish her story. She did majority of the work, but I just helped format it, format it put it out to the world. I let her be creative because um, she's the perfect example because she literally just published a book. So it's easy for me to use her as a case study uh, because we're all mutual friends. And her is the perfect example because if she went to another publishing place, they probably said, hey, you know what? You can't put that picture on the cover. Maybe you can't write this in the book. I want the author, I want to protect the author to tell their truth. I want the author to tell their story, not my story. Something that might not be comfortable for me, I'm not going to hold you back from telling your story. It's your truth. Who am I? So what's, what we do at Citadel is help authors keep their truth, be who their authentic self, right? Uh, just like Rudy said, you have to understand who you are. And we let the authors stay who they are, understand who they are, have self-awareness and not have to work and keep their royalty, mm -hmm. right? Because that's important because a lot of times these publishing companies, they, they, they take your book. If you die, your kids have nothing. It's there, it's, you know? And so this is well, not, now, I now, let- do, you, do they need to be in New York City to get it published or you- um, Absolutely you, not. No, mm -hmm. absolutely not. We have clients in Georgia. We have clients in uh, Texas. We have clients all over the country. Uh, Very good. Citadel, good. yeah, they could just go to my website, genealert.com, set up a, a consultation. I helped you, uh, you know, I'll give you direction. We yeah. have uh, we have all the services too, uh, copywriters. We have uh, editors. We have ghost writers. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, if you're too busy, we could, we could write the book, help you write the book. We have uh, um, editors for... Uh, the cover, um, page designers, website developers. You know, we have a whole array of, uh, and it's a la carte. Some clients don't need all our services. They just mm -hmm. need one or two. So we we work with the client. Uh, it's not a just one peg fits all. You know, it's a la carte. So it's, so it's more hands-on and more intimate in terms of helping people. Abs and absolutely. Not a and it sounds like it's it's not about the money. It's just about getting it's a good not, product out there. Um, and I know Gene, we were talking on camera. Um, you go, he, Gene's going to help me write my book um, entitled uh, Darnell and the Chicken Stalk instead of Jack and the Beanstalk. So we're going to be talking about that. It's going to be pretty cool when we work that. But I'm definitely going to work with this gentleman. He's doing some phenomenal things. And then Rudy, um, we're going to um, um, end it off with you now, Rudy, um, with you doing the, the great things you've done in the industry. Give us some words of wisdom for someone out there who wants to embark on this journey as being a photographer as you, and they have 42 years set in their mind of longevity, what are your thoughts? Well, first, understand the animal. Uh, what separates true fashion versus commercial fashion, commercial photography, and so forth, like I said, is the imperfection. But it's also understanding light. And one of the biggest problems that I have, one of my real pet peeves, is, is this thing of the spinal tap in the photo industry of if you, you could always fix it in Photoshop. I come from <laughs> film, okay? You had to get it right. That's why I still shoot black and white film because I, the texture, the grain, the whole bit. But really, it's about image fidelity. And that's something that goes over everybody's head. And that's basically when you shoot it, try to emulate the lighting as it is. So there's shadows here and there, but I've seen overkill on, on with photographers where they have reflectors, they got everything under the sun and the photo doesn't look exactly how it comes across in person. And that's what I said, you, you have to shoot with, your eye dictates what to shoot and your eye is, the, is actually what determines your success. And I'm not talking about, you know, I'm an enthusiast and I go on these Facebook groups and so forth and I want everybody to give an opinion. Uh, Lyndon Johnson learned the hard way that he couldn't run the country through opinion polls. You can't build a career through opinion polls. If that's what you see and if that's what you accept, so be it. 
stay on that path. Great. Well, we appreciate you gentlemen so much. Um, we wanted to get to the questions tonight, but we got so busy with a great topic. Um, these gentlemen offer some wisdom. I hope you had a pen and paper because you had Rudy here talking about his 42 years and understanding the animal and how he's given us secrets, ladies and gentlemen. This is wisdom. It's not like he's been a photographer for 42 days. This is 42 years. What were you doing 42 years ago besides wearing a jerry curl? And then we have Gene here, this gentleman, you know, I want, and we're going to talk about this, Gene, because I want to do an episode of my show right where you're sitting there in New York, because that's a nice place where you are, comfortable couch and everything. But this young I'll man, who, you look at that, look at that, that is beautiful. <laughs> this gentleman claims to be uh, 39, going on 40, but he's really 24 years old, but he is already <laughs> things, and he's filled with wisdom. I want to thank both of the gentlemen for being on the Sherrod Show tonight. Make sure... You subscribe to Essence Channel. Um, that's right on your monitor, Essence Television, as well as iHeartRadio. And please donate to the Sherrod Show, the Sharp Minded uh, fun, um, Foundation. We are help, trying to help people with autoimmune illnesses to be able to accomplish at least one dream before it's all over. And in our next episode of the Sherrod Show, we do have a very special guest. We have Latrice Lawrence stopping by the show, as well as uh, one surprise guest you got to tune in to see. I'm not even going to tell that person's name, but you got to wait and see it. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye now. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Sherrod Show. If you like additional information about our episodes, you can log on to thesherrodshow.com. You can also check us out on social media, like us on Facebook, look at our YouTube video, subscribe to our newsletter at Essence Television Networks at gmail.com. If you would like to get information to the host, Sherrod, you can email him at thesherrodshow.com. Once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.